is a very wet Alton Park that we now have for race two of the Intelligent Money British GT Championship. And this promises to throw all sorts of variables at us. We had an absolutely outstanding first race. We're going to have a very different second race. It will still be the conventional rolling start, although there will be two formation laps. The second of them will count within the hour. But who knows, with no wet running all weekend, who has got the optimum set up here? It's a bit of a roll of the dice. And let's see who comes out on top. That's the car that won race one of Tom Onslow Cole to start and the Macau driver, Kevin Say, to take over. And it makes its way round to the grid. David Anderson and Andy McEwen in the dry. Bryn Lucas in the pits on the grid, getting us west of Mermaid's flannel. He says with some relish in his voice. But Andy, this promises to be a real race of imponderables because they haven't taken to a wet circuit all weekend really and this is not necessarily the circuit you want to race one of these cars when it's wet no it's a challenging circuit at the best of times but when you add in standing yes. water <laughs> wet curbs slippery white lines it's all easier to make a mistake and it's not the kind of circuit that you can get away with that it will punish you if you make an error there are barriers and tire walls and gravel traps that will collect you if you find yourself off the road and that can very easily end your race altogether so uh, the drivers are going to have to walk a bit of a knife edge here at the start really they have to push on to try and generate and then maintain heat in the tires for many of them of course this is a really important race it's the penultimate round of the championship so as much as they'd like to take it easy and just bag a finish and make sure they're there in an hour's time at the chequered flag they are going to have to race they're going to have to push on and uh, uh, survival i think might well be key well, we've got one car, the Bentley, stuck in the pits. It's missed the red light. The pit lane is closed. That's going to have to start from there. Starting on pole position, though, we've got Malvern, and he is with Bryn Lucas out on the grid. You know, you're saying about how nice and dry you are and how wet I am. Yeah. It is horrible out here, but in the car that's nice and warm, it's Scott Malvern. It's very hot in the car, and Scott, you're starting on pole in conditions that are not favourable. Yeah, um, I mean, it depends what car you're driving, if you call them favourable or not. I mean, I think for the Porsche, it's uh, not too bad. Oh, OK, so a prediction for you is the car's going to behave out there. Yeah, we should, I think we should be good. We should be good in these conditions. Now, if you think about the cars ahead of you, uh, there are none apart from the, the course car right now. So going into that first turn in conditions like this, it's all important that you keep that, uh, that gap ahead from the car just to your right-hand side. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, obviously, the normal wet line here is on the outside at turn one. Um, so it's going to be crucial for me to get, get a good start and make sure that... Uh, Dennis doesn't get the run on me here um, around the outside at turn one, like we saw with Yelma at Snetterton. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, that's that's my main focus at the moment. Right, OK. You need some good luck as well, don't you, after the last few rounds? <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> oh, good luck, Scott. Thanks very much. Thank you. There we go. I want to show you something very quickly as well, actually, because over to this side, the number 63, the championship leaders here, just on the right-hand side, we've got nice try suckers, <laughs> as you can see. That's on the rear right-hand <laughs> side of the Lamborghini Huracan. The reason is, if you swing round for us, Brownie, you'll see just here we have a lovely Ram racing car. Now, this Ram racing car rammed into the back of that Lamborghini a little bit earlier on. Different driver. It was Loggy in the car at that time. It's now Yelma Berman, but they are directly behind their previous target. So we'll have to see what happens as they head into that first turn. I'm about to find a GT4 driver, so back to you two in the dry. Thanks very much. I tell you, it's glorious up here in the, in the dry, Bryn. You don't know what you're missing, but there's nothing quite like being on a grid of GT cars and not on a grid of GT cars. Martin Plowman, because the Bentley, as I was saying just a moment ago, missed the uh, pit lane opening times. So it is going to have to start either from the pits or at the very back, depending on whether the race director lets that car out. Now, of course, if you've got two formation laps, it's going to have to be allowed out at some stage. Otherwise, it could go a lap down. So it might be that it's allowed out to, to go to the very back of the grid rather than the start of the race if you see what I mean um, because it has been there for some time we'll see when that car's allowed to go however that's the last thing they need because they lose grid position they sit in the spray they've got all the traffic to worry about and that kind of if you like penalty isn't just the back of your class it's the back of the entire grid uh, yeah, exactly. And these are not Bentley conditions either, are they? No, so they, so. they possibly so. weren't anticipating this was going to be the strongest race for them this year. And now they have to start it from the very back, which uh, means that all they'll really be able to see at the start is a big ball of spray, knowing that somewhere in amongst it is a grid of cars ahead to negotiate. But there you can see it sat 
uh, all on its own in the uh, in the pit entry. Uh, GT4 then, uh, interesting race this for the GT4 Championship, isn't it? The 57 car on the verge of wrapping up the title. We will uh, get to that as we get towards the start of the race. But uh, within the GT4 ranks, about to take his first British GT race start for quite a while, is a welcome return, Ebrin. Yeah, his first start in a while, but you know this uh, championship pretty well, don't you, being the reigning champion? Great to see you back in a car and out here at Alton Park. Yeah, it's good to be back. I've missed it after a not-so-successful season in Europe. Um, never driven this car in the wet. I've just done the outlap from the box to here, so we'll see how we get on. But, yeah, I mean, I've been here in the wet in cars before, previous cars before, in F4 and F3 and stuff, so... Bit of a different bit of a difference but should be okay the lines are the lines and we'll see how we get on with dt next to us it's going to be difficult but yeah. we'll see we'll see how we get on so, well it's also a different size stature driver to the guy <laughs> you're currently taking over from as well so you're kind of crowbarred into this car aren't you yeah i mean it's it's, it's going to be difficult obviously not much time in the car but obviously we've been quick in the dry and you from dry to wet you know you're stopping distances difference wise and so I've got rough ideas, but no no guarantees, so we'll see how we get on. Well, good luck going into that first turn. Thank you. <laughs> well done there. Jamie yeah. Caroline, the reigning champion of GT4. Let's take a little wander up here as well, if we can, because there are some other cars, some other drivers we should talk to, and one of them we should quickly have a quick, a quick chat to is the 57 car of Burton and Burns, because as we know, the championship could be sewn up right now. So a quick word then. It could be sewn up at the end of this race. So your target, your aim. Um, win the championship. <laughs> <laughs> all right, okay, all right, keep uh, it simple. My target, honestly, just to race as usual. You know, when you start trying to think differently or back off or, you know, change your style, that's when you start making mistakes and that's when you start, you know, going off. And obviously, I'm not going for anything stupidly risky or, you know, I know I'm not going to make up loads of positions. Um, but yeah, I'm just going to drive as I normally would drive hand the car over safely to Will and uh, let him bring it home. There's been quite a talk of the conditions because no real testing over this weekend in the wet. So how interesting is this first corner, second corner going to be for you guys? I think it's always going to be interesting with turn one. I think the spray for us is going to be really bad as well. Um, but we actually did have a session. Not many people went out. Uh, the sister car didn't go out either. Um, but me and Will had a little play in the wet. Uh, was it yesterday? or no, the day before yesterday, Friday. Um, so we got a little kind of nugget of experience there. Um, but yeah, I think we'll be fine. It's not, like you said, as long as we get through to the first couple of corners, we'll be all right. Okay, so you have a little splash around in the puddles in your wellies and maybe uh, that'll help you out today. Yeah, perfect. All right, well, good luck. Cheers. There you go. So over to you two to talk us through this race. It's going to be very exciting. I'm going to get in the dry and uh, watch this unfold. <laughs> Thanks, Bryn. You've got to feel for some of the teams, like, as an example, Sandy Mitchell and Adam Ballon. They had kept, because it was a lowly grid position for the first race, thinking this would be a better one, they've kept two new sets of slicks. So what? Because now it's all bets off into the rain. Uh, yeah, absolutely. And of course, the change of weather changes the dynamic as to which cars are going to be the quickest. You know, this has traditionally been a good mid-engine kind of circuit, the Lamborghinis, the McLarens. But we know from history, they are not necessarily the cars to have in the wet conditions. The Mercedes seems really compliant in these conditions. Yeah. That might play into the hands of this car that won the first race, but also the number six car from Ram Racing that starts second on the grid. So it is all going to get turned on its head, I think. It is. Thinking Mercedes, we've lost the Sicily car after its incident in the first race with a uh, damaged gearbox from GT4. Thinking GT4, Andrew Gordon Colebrook, who gave us his opinion of the incident with Jack Brown in the first race, uh, was found guilty and a two-place grid drop, so he's on the back row now. Uh, yes, indeed, and uh, thankfully for them, that does not actually affect their result from the previous race, because if it uh, had have done, mm. well, they were out of it anyway, I suppose, weren't they? But uh, they are the only car now that can stop the 57 from winning the GT4 championship in this race. Uh, the 57 car that we just spoke to there, started by Gus Burton with Will um, Burns to take over at the pit stop. They need a point, one point. That's all they need to do. Sounds easy, doesn't it? But uh, in these conditions, it's going to be anything but. Now, in GT3, if Leo Machitsky and Dennis Lind want to win the championship in this race, they've got to win the race. If they don't win the race, the championship debate is irrelevant. Uh, to keep Ian Loggie's and Yelma Berman's hopes alive, if 63 wins, they've got to be seventh or better. Well, let's see, because uh, right now I think the main focus is on surviving, not necessarily uh, championship situations. And uh, Andy will say, but I want it to go down to the wire at Donington, <laughs> which I think most people do anyway. So there, Johnny Adam starts in the 
uh, Beach Dean AMR entry that Andrew Howard crashed yesterday. Uh, the front from a different car put onto the back of another one, sort of built out of two, really, that. But uh, at least they are here and in the race. The Bentley then missing from the grid, as I say. And the results of the earlier race, uh, taking into account 88 Mercedes that won outright doesn't score points. Therefore, what does that do to pit stop penalties? Uh, well, uh, they still, they might not score any points, but they still pick up the 10 second success penalty. But so too do the car that finished in second place, the number eight uh, team ABBA racing Mercedes of Richard and Sam Neary. They inherited the maximum points, but with it, they too take on the success penalty. So there are essentially four GC3 cars that have extra time to serve. The 88 car and the eight, they serve 10 seconds each. Barwell Motorsports 63, this could be significant. They have seven seconds to serve. And the 66 car that starts on pole position, five seconds. So both of those front row cars have extra time to serve in the pit stops. So four GT3 to serve a stop. Uh, the mandatory pit stop time, line to line, is 65 seconds. GT3, GT4 is 95 seconds. Pit window for the GT3 cars, 22 to 32 minutes. It's 28 to 38 for GT4, just to try and really alleviate some of the congestion within the pit lane. And we are about to get the formation laps underway then. So there are two of them. The second is going to count within the hour. And number 11 Bentley, one hopes, is going to be released as the cars go down through Old Hall Corner. So this is how they lined up. Scott Mulvin on pole position, Dennis Lind with him at the front of the grid. These are the pros, effectively, starting uh, race two of the weekend with Sandy Mitchell and Yelma Berman sharing the second row of the grid. Row three, Marcus Klassen and not Martin Plowman because he missed the pit lane opening slot, and so that car is still in the pit lane. And then it is Tom Onslow Cole and Phil Keane starting on the fourth row of the grid. And there you see the Bentley still stuck there. It might be allowed out when the race gets underway. The fifth row of the grid, Lewis Proctor and Sam Neary. So Sam having taken maximum points in race one. It's going to be fascinating to see what he can do in the wet here from 10th. And then Johnny Adam rounds out the GT3 element of the grid. He's going to start uh, 11th. And then you've got Darren Turner starting on pole in GT4 alongside Jamie Carolina. That's going to be quite a battle, I would have thought, between those two. Aston Martin and Toyota, respectively. Senan Fielding comes next alongside Gus Burton's BMW. And uh, then for the next row, the grid, Charlie Robertson in the Assetto Motorsports. And Ginetta and Matt Cowley in the repaired, uh, after its starter motor drama, Academy Motorsport Ford Mustang from race one. Jordan Collard for Team Rocket RJN in the McLaren alongside teammate Alain Vallon on the 10th row of the grid. Row 11 is where we will have Ashley Marshalls, Balf, McLaren and Katie Milner as Leo Machitsky watches on and tries to make an assessment, as does Adam Ballon near his tours of what the track conditions are like. Much sage nodding there going on. Andrew Gordon Colbrett then on the back row of the grid with Jamie Stanley in the Fox Motorsport McLaren. And you can see just how unpleasant in terms of the weather Alton Park has become. It's very gloomy. That spray hangs in the air. And admittedly, the first lap, in quotes of the race, in quotes, is going to be still behind the safety car but it's going to be at some speed and the spray really going to go anywhere at all. And that just shows you how wet it is. Whoever gets the lead into Old Hall when we go racing proper is in the pound seats because they'll see something. Yeah, exactly. There's no wind today. That's the problem. So as soon as the spray gets thrown up into the air, it just sort of lingers and then eventually settles. And you can see it there under the trees. Visibility ain't going to be easy. You've got to feel for the GT4 field at uh, this sort of situation as well, because even if you're leading GT4 through the first corner, you probably still won't have a huge amount of visibility, will you? But uh, yeah, track position at Alton Park always important because of, in theory, the difficult uh, the difficulty in overtaking around here, although that wasn't particularly evident in race one. Uh, but now with these wet conditions, all the more so. So they uh, come out of Lodge Corner. There is Gus Burton. Then, as I said, just needs to score a single point from this race, does this car? And they will be your provisional GT4 champions. I cannot remember the last time, someone will, I'm sure, that we had either a GT3 or GT4 overall title decided before the final round. Such has been this team's dominance. Indeed. Now, the race is on. The clock, as you see, has already started, so it's ticking on down. And Martin Plowman has got to wait and wait and wait for the entire field to go past before he's allowed out of the pit lane. So he's really going to be up against it here. Uh, whatever reason it was that they missed the pit lane, lights going to red. Uh, I'm afraid it's really done for them as they're Mark Lemmer and uh, racer and mechanic Mike Gorton at Barwell discuss life for their cars. But the Bentley has still not been allowed out. Now, if it doesn't go now, it's going to go a lap down. But the race is on, so it should be allowed out. Yes, I did hear a message, I think, before that it would be as the race starts, if you see what I mean. So although technically the hour has started, uh, it is the next lap that it will be released. So uh, 
yeah, quite what that means for whether it goes a lap down or not. We'll wait and see. But uh, but yes, yeah, so it is still sit sitting there, and of course not having a chance to get any temperature into its uh, tyres either. So uh, not only will it have poor track position, not only will that mean low visibility, but also uh, not a huge amount of grip from the rubber either. In conditions, as we said, that don't particularly suit that car anyway. Well, part of the Paddock Motorsport squad will be very worried about why that car hasn't been allowed out. The pit lane manager has gone to see Martin Plowman. He's given him a thumbs up, which I assume Martin responds to. But yeah, they're a lap down straight away. So the Bentley's irrelevant as far as the race is concerned. Uh, yes, which is a shame because it would have been nice to see how they could get on after a bit of a run of form actually they've had lately. They may not have managed to finish on the podium in race one, but they did qualify on pole, of course, and they've been pretty rapid um, all weekend long. There goes the uh, the GT4 field making its way through with the 57 car that will line up fourth on the grid. Newbridge Motorsport, of course, have an opportunity here, don't they, to try and get another race victory, what would be their fourth of the year, and uh, they start from that pole position. But we are lining up two by two. We're going to get a proper rolling start then, albeit a few minutes into the race. Indeed so. Uh, this, therefore, means at the end of lap one, the cars are going to go racing proper. It also means the Bentley goes into this a lap down, uh, but you could argue that that was a self-induced penalty because they missed the pit lane opening slot. There is... Uh, a time communicated to the teams that everybody must adhere to, everybody else did, but the Paddock Motorsport Bentley missed out. So Scott Mulvern versus Dennis Lind, the second row of the grid, Sandy Mitchell lining up alongside Yelma Berman. It's going to be a, a fantastic fight, I would have thought, and also keep an eye on the race one winner, Tom Onslow Cole. We've got the weather, we've got the pit stop penalties to factor into this as well. And so for round eight of the Intelligent Money British GT Championship and Alton Park, it is go. They blast away, and now the heart in mouth moment comes as they go diving down towards Old Hall Corner for the first time. And Sandy Mitchell dives up the inside of Dennis Lind as they turn into the corner, but it is uh, Scott Mulvern then, who is away clear in the lead of the race. They blast downhill now, the spray hangs in the air. Porsche versus Lamborghini, it is Mulvern ahead, Lind second, Mitchell is third, and then Yelma Berman is fourth. And in GT4, for the second race in a row, it's the car that starts second that gets the lead. Look, because Jamie Caroline is actually mixing it with some of the tail enders in GT3. Such was his rapid start. So Caroline leads in GT4. The GT3 leaders, though, uh, descend upon the shell area of the circuit. And Scott Mulvern in the Porsche that he, he reckoned would be good in these conditions. So far, living up to those expectations, he's pulling away, I would say, from Lind in the first half a lap. Yes, so he's got the visibility, which is going to help, but Dennis Lynn going after him, wants points, needs the win, rattles over the kerbs. So also does Yelma Berman here as the uh, field accelerates up over hill top. Look back, GT4, that good start by Jamie Caroline is there, but you've got number eight, Mercedes of Sam Neary, trying to hustle its way up the order. So Mulvern leads into his lops. Dennis Lind riding the kerb in second spot. Mitchell third, Berman fourth. In fifth place is Marcus Clutton. There's another live wire around here. Sixth is Tom Onslow Cole there. Seventh, it is Phil Keane. Eighth is Neary. But there, Jamie Caroline goes through ahead of Darren Turner and a rather understeery BMW was next, wasn't it? Gus Burton fighting the M4 as they went up through Nickerbrook. He was up to third there, wasn't he? Ahead yeah. of Senator Fielding, so he'd gained a place. Did he hold on to it there? Because it looked as though one of the McLarens, maybe uh, Jordan Collard, was uh, challenging him after that moment. On board with Phil Keane then, Tom Onslow Cole ahead of us. This is the battle going into Lodge Corner. As around the outside goes the Lamborghini, can he find the traction? The wide line should be the grippier side of the road. He's certainly quicker off the corner, gets alongside Onslow Cole. This will give him the inside line for Old Hall Corner, which he can't actually see just now, but it's somewhere in the distance. Here it is, and through on the inside should go Phil Keane. Can Onslow Cole now retaliate on the exit? He gets a better exit from the corner and might try and challenge again into Cascades. So downhill they drop. The lead gap has certainly opened up, hasn't it, between Scott Mulvern and Dennis Lind as the cars pour their way down through Cascades. Keane trying to get through and gain further ground. All the while, Neary hustles on and the race leaders splash their way once again down towards Ireland Bend. GT4, Jamie Caroline, Darren Turner, Gus Burson, Jordan Collard, Senan Fielding, Matt Cowley is the order. So lots of variety in terms of the brands. But you've got to say, track conditions right now are pretty horrible and fair play for everybody thus far for keeping out of strife. In fairness, though, I'm not seeing too many rivers, not too many puddles. It's wet, definitely, but standing water is not actually such an issue. It's more the spray and the actual uh, grip levels, but perhaps not such a risk of aquaplaning as we uh, might have seen elsewhere. Uh, there is Sam Neary out of the British chicane. The leaders are at the next chicane already at his lops. There go Mulvern. Lind, Mitchell, Berman, Clutton, and then this group that we've just been following. You can see the way that Keane is getting away from Tom Onslow Cole. As Sam Neary just behind, maybe outbraked himself a little there. That just gives Lewis Proctor 
incentive to try and have a go coming out of the chicane. GT4, meanwhile, as close as you like. And the last time we had a champion crown before the last round was GT4, Ross Gum, Jamie Chadwick going back to, what, 2015? And then through goes Yelma Berman accelerating down now towards Lodge Corner. But up front, it is Scott Mulvan then who leads the way, turns down into the right at Lodge Corner and accelerates now up towards the end of the second racing lap. So we'll go through. And there you've got number eight, which is the Sam Neary Mercedes. Now, slightly bizarrely, I thought we'd had now two racing laps, plus one behind the form of the safety car, the formation, the extra formation lap within the hour, but only the racing laps are being counted. Yes, I don't think that extra warm-up lap counted as a racing lap. They just had to start the time at that point, I think, because uh, the reason you realise that is that Martin Plowman did not go a lap down after all, so although he's done one fewer lap than everybody else, still he's there at the back of the lead lap, which I'm sure Paddock Motorsport will be pretty happy with. Jamie Caroline here out of Old Hall Corner, they're building quite a lead, isn't he, look, over the 27 car behind. Remember, this Toyota has no extra time to serve in the pit lane, but he's very wide down at Cascades. Oh, that was a real heart in mouth moment. Well saved, Jamie, so got away with that, but uh, accelerating then now, and the car hustles on towards Island Bend. Jamie Caroline flinging everything at this. He's in danger of toppling off the road again there, but all the while he's trying to find where the grip is. And of course, quite often, extra grip can be found on the outside of the circuit. So if you can get onto that, it will uh, pay dividends for you. But uh, he's had a few wide moments, we understand. Right, replay of the start here, Andy. Uh, yes, so it was pretty even actually in the front of the grid, but I think everyone being pretty careful uh, as they went towards Old Hall Corner. It was in GT4 that we sure saw a bit more shuffling. Watch the white and red Toyota around the outside line at the head of that second group of cars. Scott Mulvan holds the lead overall. Lind in second place tries to find the grip around the outside. And then in the background, look there in GT4 goes Jamie Caroline right around the outside. You could see there, David, how much more grip there was and how much more momentum that gave Jamie coming around the outside. That's looking back from Dennis Lynn's Lamborghini through the spray. But Dennis doing the right thing. I mean, again, all the pros starting here. They're not going to force the issue. They're not doing anything silly. And you could argue that if we had to have a wet race, it's, it's better that the pros are doing this rather than the ants, potentially. So right now, rather than Dennis Lynn going after Scott Mulvan for the race lead, he's actually having to look to his laurels, isn't he? Because Sandy Mitchell there is right up behind him. So does that tell you that the Porsche is an absolute weapon in the wet? Uh, well, there's certainly Scott Mulvan seems to think that, and the uh, Porsches have gone well in Europe, haven't they, in the wet over the last year or so. Uh, but then you've got Lind in a Lamborghini, an identical car, but by the same team is right behind him, Sandy Mitchell. And Mitchell on the previous lap was half a second quicker than him. So uh, Dennis may be just not quite acclimatising to these conditions as quickly as he might like. Sandy Mitchell then looking to try and find a way past him if he can. Remember, the 63 car leads the champion chip coming into this race but the number one car is in fourth place only just over thir uh, just under 30 points behind so Mitchell could do with getting past his teammate here he could I mean whether this is Dennis Lynn thinking all right I'll just go for points or whether he is genuinely still trying to learn about Alton Park in the wet because it's relatively new to him unlike Sandy Mitchell you know he spent more laps around here discuss Dennis no stranger to wet racing he's done enough spa 24 hours for example to know about the rain but he power boats his way out of Nickerbrook climbs the hill once again but Scott Mulvan last time around led by a second and a half and Sandy Mitchell has done the best lap of the race uh, yeah 145.390 which is about 10 seconds away from the pace they had in race one so actually uh, they're not that much slower than they were in the dry conditions earlier on certainly not as far off the pace as I uh, thought they would be down towards Lodge we go in the sectors by the way on this lap Lind is now starting to come back at Malvern in the first sector he was quicker in the second sector he was about three tenths quicker so is that gap between the top two going to start coming down it was one and a half seconds at the end of lap number three and at the end of lap four yeah 1.1 okay interesting so it was Sandy Mitchell doing the fastest lap it's now Marcus Clatton so Clutton is catching Berman, Berman is going after the Lamborghinis, and the Lamborghinis are definitely catching the Porsche. That gap to the eye, less than it was a lap ago. So that was where I asked you whether the Porsche was a weapon. Right now, the Lamborghini is looking more like weapons, and of the two, Mitchell is the quicker. He had a better line through Cascades than Dennis Lynn did on that lap. Now, no doubt Mark Lammers on the radio saying, don't battle against each other too much, let's get to the pit stops and go from there, really, because the last thing he needs, especially with one car going for a championship here, is the pair of them off the racetrack. Trouble is, they're both going for a championship. If, if the one car was way back in the points, then that might maybe hold a bit more water. But at the moment, I think Sandy Mitchell <laughs> is only really thinking about one thing, and that's gaining more points. And that's a very nervous Mark Lemmer watching on for the Barwell garage. Uh, Barwell is one of the top teams within GT3 in the UK, no question about it. 
Good pedigree in the British GT Championship and GT World Challenge Europe, for example. And there are the Lamborghinis. Dennis Lynn has a lot more curb than uh, Sandy Mitchell there, certainly into his lot. And elsewhere, I think we've seen him have a big bite of curbing as well. But uh, Dennis Lynn versus Sandy Mitchell accelerating now up the hill. Dennis Lind also, of course, part of the Audi stable for IGTC races, the Intercontinental GT Challenge, so switching chassis for certain events. But he goes now into Druid, and it is still Scott Morville in the lead. Now, do we need to look at this car as an example of somebody, the Mercedes of Yelma Berman, inching up onto the tail of the leading trio? Uh, ish. He was a tenth quicker than the Lamborghinis in the middle sector, but he was slower than them in the first sector, so uh, it's ebbing and flowing almost by the corner. He might start to catch them if they start to get delayed by Mulvey which I think is imminent because the gap that was 1.1 seconds a lap ago is now down to three quarters of a second. So give Linda Mitchell another lap or so. They'll be on the tail of the Porsche and then Yelma Berman might be able to catch. For the time being, though, Yelma is quicker than the leader, but a tenth or so off the Barwell Lambos. So down through Cascades they turn. Lead gap down again, seven tenths of a second. So, yeah, the Lamborghinis are looking stronger. Where's Phil Keane's car? Still six, hunting down Marcus Clatton, but... Yeah, from a couple of laps ago, Scott Morgan getting away. Very definitely, Lyndon Mitchell are closing that gap as they come down towards uh, Shell Oils. And that is Seddon Fielding versus Darren Turner. And the Audi goes through for second in GT4 right now. And, of course, that Aston has got a longer pit stop anyway. So that's not great news, is it, for the Aston Martin squad? Uh, although Stella have a five-second success penalty as well, plus the 14 extra seconds for the Silver Cup entry. So, actually, ironically, although they finished behind the Aston Martin in the previous race, their pit stop will still be longer, so uh, important move that from Senen. For the race lead, it couldn't be a lot closer now, only a car length or so in it then. Scott Mulvin is going to have to turn to defence now if he's to keep Dennis Lind and Sandy Mitchell at bay, and this time around, Yelma Berman definitely is catching them. He was a tenth quicker in the first sector. Marcus Clutton behind him going even faster than that, though. In the middle sector, Berman, another three or four tenths faster. So these gaps now are going to really start to shrink as the leaders get themselves together. Yeah, and Clutton's problem is he's going to get stuck, isn't he? Because before long, he will catch the queue, as you rightly say but then struggle to find a way by. Sandy Mitchell has caught Lynn, but you know, to get past, he's going to have to go offline. He keeps trying to force a mistake out of Dennis, coming now through Lodge Corner, the two of them. Accelerate up dearly once again over the timing line, so it remains the Porsche then in the lead of the race. Scott Mulvin dives down towards Old Hall Corner. They're second and third. The Lamborghinis, Lynn ahead of Mitchell. Berman is fourth. Spray still being kicked up from all of them. In fifth place, it is Marcus Classic, Phil Keane, sixth, Tom Onslow Cole in seventh, Sam Neary eighth, Louis Proctor ninth, and Johnny Adam really struggling to get through the traffic. You still get the feeling that Aston is not 100%, don't you? Uh, yeah, which is not a huge surprise, I guess, but it is a bit of a shame, isn't it? Because this was a weekend they probably expected to score some good points. Top three cars then, less than eight tenths of a second apart at the start of this seventh lap of the race. So Lind and Mitchell have caught Scott Molden. But now they've got to do something about getting past him. And as you alluded to, it's almost harder to overtake in these conditions because there is one line that is definitively faster than the other. And to overtake, you're going to have to go onto that slower line, that more slippery line. Oh, but uh, Lynn really clobbers the curb there through the yeah. bridge again. He does take a lot of curb. I'm not convinced it's helping him, but it does look spectacular. Down towards his locks they go. And Sandy Mitchell again trying to force this mistake out of Dennis Lynn. Second and third, the Lamborghinis both now taking a big bite of curb. Quick word as you watch this about what's going on in GT4. Jamie Caroline is getting away because now he has dropped so far back from the GT3 train that actually he's got really good visibility. There's no spray for him. So he is storming along and, of course, with no pit stop penalty and a pro-am combination, not a silver. It should be a slick pit stop. That Toyota find wood to touch for it, but it's looking quite strong. Yeah, they've still not won a race this year either, have they? Despite being in contention on multiple occasions. So... Uh... We'll wait and see what happens to them over the rest of the race. We are a quarter of the way in. Then again, Mitchell looks to the inside. It looks good on the way into the corner, but then the traction is on the outside for Lind, and he comes off the turn a lot quicker than either of the cars around him. Across the line they go again. Mulvan a tenth faster than Lind that time, but that's almost academic now that they're this close together. Dennis Lind just needs to try and find the way through. Dennis's pit stop, or the 63 car's pit stop, will be three seconds longer than the 66 car ahead as well. So actually, at the moment, it's the one car set to benefit because that is the highest placed car without a success penalty to serve. So they're down to Island Bend, come the headlights, Porsche, Lamborghini, Lamborghini, and then in fourth place, Yelma Berman, who's almost there, but that's Jamie Caroline leading as he comes out of Druids in GT4. 
Makes a great noise, that Toyota. And the Speedworks Supra up front, Toyota Gazoo Racing UK. It's the uh, branded car, that GR badge, Gazoo Racing, adorning all the high-performance models. But in second place now, look, you can see the gap coming down. Set and Fielding hustling on in the Audi. And there, look, Martin Plowman in the Bentley. Now, he is up, therefore, in two. 13th place overall from the pit lane. So we're over 15 minutes in and he still hasn't cleared the GT4 cars, which shows just how difficult it is to make the progress through. But he does now clear the second placed car. Senate Fielding on that lap, eight tenths faster than Caroline, and he's getting a big chunk of that time in the middle sector through those chicanes where the, the Audi just changes direction a little better maybe than the Toyota. But as you made the point earlier on, the Audi is in the silvers, so it's going to be a longer stop. So advantage being gained on pace, but it will head back to the Toyota on the pit stops. Uh, yeah, and they've got a five-second success penalty to serve, so it will be 19 seconds longer the pit stop for the Audi than for the Toyota. So even if Fielding can clear Caroline, it still won't give them the lead once all is said and done with the pit stops, which we're not a million miles away from now either, of course. We're nearly 20 minutes in, back to the GT3 leaders, as close as ever they were across the start-finish line. But uh, still, it looks as though Dennis Lynn does not have anything here for Scott Mulvin at this stage. But as you said, I'm sure he's driving with one eye on the championship as much as fighting for the race victory and right now second place with a teammate as almost a wingman behind him is not a bad place for him to be I'll tell you what i would not want to be and that is an am getting into a car in a battle which is this close in the rain good luck to them all scott Malvin will give way to nick jones dennis lynn to Nia Michitsky, who's a kind of am plus i guess sandy mitchell to adam ballon uh, but uh, it is certainly very very slippery and very treacherous out there and it might well be that we have a very different complexion in that second stint. Jamie Caroline's just had his first warning about track limits in the Supra, still leading in GT4. That point you make there about the AMs, of course, the... Oh, Lynn, very sideways. That was too much curb. Surely he comes out of the bridge ah, again. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, uh, yes, he actually does come out a little bit further ahead, maybe, of Mitchell when he was going in. Uh, but, yeah, the point you make about the AMs, you know, the pro drivers that started the race, they had an outlap to the grid. They had those two laps behind the safety car to assess the conditions. The AM will jump straight in and bang, they're into a battle, like you said. So that is really, really tricky to do. Could you not say bang? <laughs> I know what you mean, but yes, um, let's err on the side of caution here. Yeah, it's going to be very, very tough indeed. You're absolutely right. So uh, we've had quite a lot of wet GT racing at Alton Park over the years. 2002 with a big drama at Nickerbrook and a red flag was probably the worst. There was one that was completely abandoned, wasn't it, with track conditions worsening a few years back too. But right now, Scott Malvin is leading by only half a second, and it's less than a second covering the top three. We are heading towards the pit window opening. Incidentally, Martin Plowman in the Bentley did boom past the Supra last time, going in towards Old Hall Corner, so he's worked his way now uh, up into 11th place as the race leaders now have to encounter the traffic. This is going to be a real test of Scott Malvin. This is where things all changed in the first race. It had been pretty pedestrian's not the word, but they'd certainly been minding their P's and Q's, hadn't they, until they caught the GT4 traffic. And that is an opportunity, especially in the wet, to just make something happen, do something different, and maybe try and work your way past the car ahead of you. So uh, they clear the Jamie Stanley McLaren cleanly, but next up, you've got Andrew Gordon Colbrook, who's battling to try and get past uh, Katie Milner's McLaren. Over there, you can see those two almost side by side, right in front of the leaders. Indeed so, and Marcus Classon hustles on as now Scott Malvin tries to pick his way through the traffic and he can't do so there not only can he not get past the back mark but he's got two of them to get through and now it's five in a line virtually Dennis Lynn is on the attack as they come over hilltop this is where you discover just how narrow Alton Park is or how wide a GT3 car is and they're trying to weave their way in and out the slower cars Katie Milner gets in the way a little bit there and Scott Malvin almost being given a tap in the tail by Dennis Lynn he's got nowhere to go Malvin has the road open up finally but Dennis Lynn died for the inside line Katie Milner kind of forced out of the way rather than gets out of the way because the leaders are coming through. That was real touchy-feely stuff, wasn't it, there? Lind into the back of Mulvan on more than one occasion, not really intentionally, no. just because the pace had been slowed so much. For fourth place, meanwhile, Yelma Berman still struggling to get past Milner, and here comes Marcus Clutton in the McLaren, which is supposed to be a little bit of a nightmare to drive in the wet, isn't it? But Marcus is flying. Lynn to the outside of Malvern. There might be grip on the outside. Where's Mitchell in all of this as well? He's on the inside of his teammates, side by side for second place. The Barber Lamborghini's dead level over the line, and they both have a bit of a run on the Porsche ahead. And to the inside line, Sandy Mitchell. He's got the line for the corner. He should get second place. He does. He goes through. 
and also Marcus Clutton has just gone ahead of Yelma Berman. So behind all of this as Lynn fights back, the Lamborghinis come almost side by side down towards Cascades. Sandy Mitchell has done it, and behind them the change for fourth has happened as well. So now you've got up into fourth place Marcus Clutton ahead of Yelma Berman. So Sandy Mitchell now takes up the cudgels on behalf of Barwell to go after Scott Mulvin. If he can crack Dennis Lind, can he crack Mulvin before the stops? I think Mitchell is the quicker of the two. The way that he was pressuring Lind up until that point, he caught him pretty rapidly, uh, even before Dennis was in the spray properly of the Porsche ahead. So I reckon Mitchell might just have the pace here, but it's just so difficult to get past. If he can stay with Mulvin, though, there's always a chance in traffic. Mulvin right up on two wheels. Lind continuing to abuse the curbs there through the chicane at Britain's, but he can see his teammate getting away. And that, I'm afraid, is Tom Onslow Cole, who is off at Ireland, and he's beached in the gravel. That, I'm afraid, ain't going to be able to stay there, I wouldn't have thought. So just as we get towards the pit window, I rather fear that we might end up with a neutralisation here as the leaders battle their way out of the right-hander of Nickerbrook. If it can happen to a pro, imagine what it can do to the AMs. And if anybody else goes off there and finds a parked car, then it's going to be a pretty damaging consequence. So Peter Daly, the race director, will have a look at this. And I would have thought the safety car will be thrown, I have to say, but it's not happened yet. So the field comes down towards uh, Lodge Corner. And the GT3 pit window is open. Now the pros, as there, Mitchell has a little look for the race lead. I would imagine the pro drivers will stay out for as long as possible to maximise their available track time. But Sandy Mitchell is on the attack very definitely as they go down towards Old Hall Corner. Scott Mulvan is under huge pressure then. And look, Dennis Lind has fallen away quite markedly on that last lap. This is a real, real head-scratcher, though, for the teams, because you're right, they want to leave the pros in as long as possible unless they think there will be a safety car, in which case, anticipating that, pitting early, might actually buy them some time. It's a risk, but if they're convinced there'll be a safety car, then that might well be the way to go. Yellow flags, of course, on this part of the circuit because of the Onslow coal car in the gravel. So as much as Mitchell would love to keep attacking, he has to back out of it just for the time being. Through the left-hander at Ireland they go, uh, past the stricken Mercedes and back into a green flag zone now so they can continue to uh, race. Here's a replay, meanwhile, of what happened to Tom. Just ran out of road, didn't he? Ran it wide, slithered onto the grass, the car not damaged stuck in the gravel now quite often wet gravel compact so can if he gets it fired up could he drive out of there maybe that's why there's no safety car they just give him the time to see whether he can drive himself out of there but as i say if anybody else does that they're going to hit a parked car so you would have anticipated that if he can't drive out the race needs suspending here they come in the meantime out of his lops pit window for the gt3 cars is open and now sandy mitchell comes up to attack the porsche but scott mulvan then set to hand over to nick jones is under attack, Nick is ready to go. He's had a word with Bryn Lucas and said this should be fun. The only information he's got is what he's seen on TV. And what, what he's seeing on TV would be mo enough probably to put most people off going out there at all, but Nick's still relishing it now. Mitchell held up in traffic, suddenly the leader gets away and Lind has a big, big run on his teammate down to Lodge. So Mitchell now has to turn from attack to defence, goes to the inside line, Marcus Clutton is a part of this as well, and he now almost draws level with Lind through the final turn. Lind is really quick with that wide line off Lodge corner and the battle for second about to flash across the start-finish line with Mitchell taking the defensive line, Lind to the outside, Clutton looking for a way through as well and still there is more GT4 traffic ahead Mulvan already look is starting to be drawn back towards them so Scott Mulvan leads the way this is Marcus Klassen's view Marcus much underrated driver and he's as much driving as running the team so as he comes now onto lakeside straight Dennis Lind runs it up wide look at the spray there you cannot see a car they all disappear into the gloom yellow flags yellow lights at this section of the circuit at Island Bend and as the race leaders come through, we now go safety car. So, as expected, later than expected, but as expected, we go safety car. And now, of course, the safety car team have got to try and pick up a leader and would be no surprise if people now try to exploit that. Uh, yeah, well, we're going to see a flurry of activity now. They have to pit. If you don't, then uh, you're going to end up finding, just finding yourself right at the back uh, of the lead lap queue. So uh, we're on board then with Lind, he's heading over hill top, so the teams have about half a lap then to prepare for this. There is the safety car, which has no one to collect right now because everyone's at the far end of the circuit. In fact, the first car it's gonna find is gonna be the Bentley, isn't it? Because Martin Plowman comes across the line now, doesn't pit, and he is about to be collected by that BMW safety car. The rest of them, though, I'm sure, will be making their way into the pit lane this time around. And what does this mean? Well, it should be advantage 
number one car because they do not have the success penalty to serve, but nor do Enduro Motorsport in the McLaren and nor do Ram Racing in the Mercedes. So uh, it is still going to be mighty, mighty competitive at the front. Right, so there the Bentley has been picked up by the safety car. That needs to be waved past, which I think is what is now happening. Yes, so the uh, plan of having the safety car out on the circuit, but only if you like... Uh, Go to full safety car conditions when you have a leader. Well, finding a leader is not the work of the moment because in, 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 in come pretty much everybody out of the top six. So there you've got Scott Mulvan to morph into Nick Jones. The Lamborghinis at the pit in and have arrived. Marcus Clatton to give way to Morgan Tilbrook. That's Yelma Berman going through the shot to give way to Ian Loggy. And in come the Neeries. So pretty much everybody out of GT3 comes in. You'd be silly not to. Yeah, it's a free pit stop, essentially, pitting behind the safety car. You lose significantly less time than if you do it under green flag conditions. But as everyone's coming anyway, it makes relatively little difference. They think there are no exceptions to the rule this time. Everybody in GT3 heading in. Their look is uh, Johnny Adam to hand over to Andrew Howard. Who gets out first, though? That's the real question. We're anticipating it should be this car if all things are equal. But we saw in the last race, didn't we, some teams having quicker pit stops than others. Yeah, of course with the pit stops to a, a, a set time, line to line, it's not quite as uh, beneficial as it would be in a, a natural race. But I think number six Mercedes is going to come out of this pretty well also, look, because that's at the pit out end. So where's Lamborghini number one? It's going to be the Mercedes that jumps them all, isn't it? So Yelma Berman came in fifth, and Ian Loggy will go out in the lead of the race. now, And there, look, Phil Keane's car. Now Michael Igo goes up to second. So what's happened to Barwell? Because the Mitchell Ballon car, your prediction has had a really bad stop, relatively speaking, and fallen a long way down. Now, either that means that others have undercut the pit stop, which can happen, or another team has made a really bad pit stop, but that's not the order we expected. Yeah, that minimum pit stop time for GT3 is 65 seconds. There's quite a lot to do in that 65 seconds, so it's not unheard of for them to go over that time. Uh, and I wonder if that's what happened with Barwell. I did also spot that Ian Loggy, who got out first, was very, very slow on his way out of the pit lane. Because remember, that minimum pit stop time is measured from line to line. It's not the stationary time. It's the time from the pit entry line to the pit exit line. If you think you've anticipated it a bit too much, you can sometimes just slow down to make sure you don't leave too soon. So that's going to put Ian Loggy into the lead of GT3, not the lead of the race, because right now, of course, it's going to be the GT4 cars that lead. So Jamie Caroline will be the race leader as uh, there Michael Igo hustles on. So, yeah, I mean, it could be that a team had a bad pit stop. Was it Snetterton last year, for example, where Rob Collard and Sandy Mitchell got uh, yeah. the belts caught somewhere and lost time trying to fish the belts? Like little things like that. Now, Jamie Caroline is not leading the race because he's in the pits, I think, because that now means that uh, behind the safety car is the Audi number 42 as the new uh, race leading car. Yeah, had Caroline definitely gone a lap down to the GT3 leaders? I know that the Audi had, I think, hadn't it? I'm not sure. I think this might have split the GT4 field, if you see what I mean, but it happening with a pit stop window uh, at the same time, it does make things a little well, bit complicated. Caroline's in the pits. Oh, he is in. Right, yeah. OK. OK, good. Yes, the Toyota's at the far end of the pits from where we are, so the rest of the GT4 field in as well. So there they are, look. Pit stop exit of Ian Loggy under investigation. Mm, he was very slow. He was very, very slow, which I seem to recall seeing people getting penalties for in the past. Adam Carroll here leaps to mind ah. many years ago. Yes, exactly the same thing. Uh, so in GT3, it is Loggy from Igo, from Jones, from Ballon, from Tilbrook, from Machitsky, from Proctor Senior, from Neary Senior. Uh, and Ballon, I'm hearing, stalled. Uh, and oh, then got right. sort of held up by everyone else being pushed back in front right of him. He should have been long gone by right, then, but yeah. he got sort of caught in the traffic. There you go. That accounts for why that lost places. So, yeah, I mean, sometimes people misjudge the pit stop and go under, but there's an example of a team getting it wrong and going over. The Super is about to go, and out of the gravel, Tom Onslow Cole has arrived in the pit lane. Yes, and pulls in now for a driver change. So, uh, oh, what a very close moment there. That was the Assetto Ginetta ahead of the Toyota. Is that for position? If it yes. is, that would be a real turn up for the books. Should be. So that's Mark Sanson then ahead of John Ferguson. So that nice little lead that Jamie Caroline had built up hasn't quite been converted into the race lead post pit stops. So again, is that because it was a slower stop from one team or has somebody else been a bit under on the pit stop time to force that jump? Well, if you are under what your regulation pit stop time is, the data is there to be presented from TSL, the timekeeping service, to the race director, and there's nowhere to hide. Bang, there's a penalty brewing. So if that is the case, we'll soon find out. 
uh, yeah, absolutely. You can't really argue it, can you? But uh, as I say, we've seen these penalties before, especially during a safety car period, because everyone's so close together, you don't want to waste even a second, because that could cost you a position or two if you don't get pushed back into the fast lane quickly enough. So uh, that is why we've seen this kind of thing happen in the past. Uh, Kevin Say, by the way, just seen out of the window, is back in the race, so they're laps down, but at least he'll get uh, a little bit more track time, albeit not in the most pleasant of, of uh, conditions. No, indeed, as in comes then the remaining element of GT4, including Senan Fielding, who was leading the class, and Darren Turner. Darren celebrated his winning race one with his traditional cup of tea, and uh, this time lemon drizzle cake, the cake of champions, ah, nice. you know. Uh, and so impressed was he with his own drive, he had a second slice. So <laughs> whether that's um, helped, because of course he comes in not leading, discuss, but uh, the driver change cycles through. Now, out of these, of course, one is a silver with a long stop, one is a pro-am with a shorter stop, but the shorter stop for the Pro-Am is then compensated for almost by the fact that it's got 10 seconds as a race winner. So it, it, the Aston should get out ahead, but only just. Should, yes, but we've been wrong with these predictions already today, so we'll, we'll see in about a minute's time who comes out of the pit lane first. Uh, the GT3 cars then are behind the safety car. The Bentley is not leading the race. That car has pitted now, but is almost uh, a lap behind the rest of the GT3s. You'd imagine that will be waved through at well, some point. Well, mm, really? because the idea of the safety car is it picks up the leader. It did, it got the leader behind when that was the leading GT4 car. As they've now pitted, the race order is what is behind the safety car. Wrong place for the Bentley, but that's where it was in the order around the GT4 cars, because it had only just got to the head of them. They've now bailed out of the way. Uh, yes, uh, yes, possibly. Um, we'll wait and see on that one as well, shall we? <laughs> Lots of unknowns here today at Alton Park, but I'm sure that um, Ian Loggy would prefer it, honestly, if the Bentley was waved through, because that means that he would then be the first car on the track, although blue flags fairly... There you go. There we go, you see. So, uh, they, so they have waved him through. It's always better, I think, if the, the actual race leader is the car to control the restart, really, because, of course, once the safety car pulls away, it's then the car at the front of the queue that, that sort of decides the pace. That really should be the race leader. And that race leader is Ian Loggy. And from a championship perspective, this is good news for Ram, isn't it? Because the 63 car is outside of the top five. The number one car is behind it. They've got the 18 car behind as well. If Loggy can hang on to this, this could really help them in the points. So right now, Loggy, Igo, Jones, Ballon, Tilbrook, Machitsky, Stuart Proctor, Richard Neary, Andrew Howard is the order in GT3. And the safety car we anticipate to be in at the end of the next lap, fingers crossed. It's not going to be in this time. Lights are still on and it's a little bit late to go. But the uh, Bentley, I think, now that it's been released, needs to be given at least one lap to try and catch up uh, before we can really get things underway. Of course, this is one of those big dilemmas you've been released you want to catch the queue but you're under safety car conditions so you're not meant to be going absolutely flat out but how far and how quickly do you push knowing that you know the race director's done his bit he's let you go but you're not going to get a chance to catch the crocodile at 50 miles an hour it'll take ages so mark townsend for Assetto in the janetta coming down towards lodge just to remind you that we are into the second part of the race 26 minutes to go and although some of the cars are silver silver drivers in the majority of the cases certainly gt3 you've got your am out of the pro-am car in and you could argue that the weather is worse now than it has been race long because more rain has fallen uh, it is still treacherous out there and of course tire temperatures and pressures have dropped uh, indeed, so you've got less temperature in the tyres, more water to contend with on the circuit, and everyone's closer together again now, so you can't really ease your way into this, you're straight into a battle. Uh, now, championship-wise, I suggested there that this result might well help Ian Loggy and Yalma Berman. If we threw the chequered flag now, thankfully we're not, we've got 25 minutes of racing to go, but if we did throw the chequered flag now, Berman and Loggy would lead the championship by half a point <laughs> going wow. to the final round at Donington Park. There is a lot still to shake out in this, but that is how close it could be. And the Ballon Mitchell Lamborghini is under investigation for its pit release. Yeah. So having stalled and then getting a bit delayed in the pushbacks, did something wrong happen there? Or was it deemed to have impeded another entrant? Let us see. Ian Loggy then uh, leads the way. He has had some bad luck in the past and more might be brewing because the team manager of the leading car has to go to the race director. There it is. So the uh, number one uh, pit stop under investigation confirmed, but the team manager from Ram Racing has got to go to race control. This is what we know about number one. So it's pushed back. Now that looks okay, but that's where it stalls. Now I, I wonder whether 
the race control team are thinking he stopped because he wanted the time to flick down rather than stalling it. Because if, yeah. do you remember at Snetterton, once you were pushed back into the fast lane, you have to of, go. it was Marcus Clutton, wasn't it? Yeah. There, lights are out on the safety car, but once you've been pushed back, you've got three or four seconds in which to go. And if he stalled it and lost more than that time allowance, hot water might be being run here. Even if it wasn't intentional, at the end of the day, it's still a mistake. Well, from the driver, arguing so. case, haven't you? So yeah. that's why it's being looked at. Interesting. Yeah, indeed. Right, we're going to go racing. We've got 23 minutes and change on the clock. The safety car is in. And if you follow the British Touring Car Championship, there's a phrase you might have heard. It is that safety cars breed safety cars. It's wet, they're all bunched up. Safety car has helped in that respect, and we go racing again. So we're in business. Over the timing line, Ian Loggy leads. This is the first racing lap for the AMs in their GT3 cars. Hold on tight. Into Old Hall Corner, they dive. It is still wet and horrible out there. So far, so good as they power their way now down towards Cascades. And in GT4, then, it is Mark Sansom ahead of James Kelvin, the top two in the GT4 championship. There uh, are the two BMWs, as in the GT3 ranks, it is nose to tail here for third position. Adam Ballard challenging Nick Jones in the Porsche as they head down towards Island Bend. The leading two drivers are nose to tail as well, as Michael Igo seems to be on his toes here on the restart. Ballard is through into third position, then ahead of Nick Jones. So we've got a Barbell Lamborghini into third place. The other Barbell car, remember, is down in sick and Michael Igo all arms and elbows there as he tries to keep the car pointing in the right direction. Yeah, Igo's going for a home win, isn't he? Because he's local to Alton Park, he wants the win. And uh, looking further down the order, we've lost a class lead from the Ginetta, have we not? Because Mark Sanson has already been jumped there by James Kell. I tell you what, James is a much, much improved driver this year, isn't he? Switching from the Supra to the McLaren. He's looked really, really good this year as the top two are about to become the top three, maybe top four. That concertinering. Yeah, they are. Now that ballon has been released, he's gapping Nick Jones, isn't he? And he will love seeing how uh, close together the top two are running because that means they're delaying each other. Uh, Morgan Tilbrock, look, has lost fifth position now to Leo Machitsky. So Machitsky into the top five. More championship points then for the championship leader. As it stands then, that would put the 63 car back on top of the points by a very narrow margin going into the championship decider. But this is all pending this conversation that's going on regarding the number six's pit stop. If they get a penalty, that changes everything. On board with Machitsky then in the 63 car that heads into Lodge Corner on a very tight line, actually not taking the traditional racing line, staying off the bit of the track that has all of the rubber laid down because that gets slippery when wet and it seems to work because it comes off the corner pretty quickly. The cars ahead are getting bigger and bigger in our windscreen, so we're catching them. And Machitsky with a 53-0 is three tenths faster than Nick Jones in the Porsche ahead of him. We've had Richard Neary ahead of Stuart Proctor for seventh as well, so quite a few changes that time through. Uh, in the GT3 ranks, as well as this change for the leading GT4. In fact, Mark Sansom falls behind two of the silver-graded drivers because not only is James Kell leading GT4, but James's uh, Rocket RJN teammate, Michael ben -Yaya, is through into second place. So down they come then, currently working lap number 19. Ian Loggy led at the end of the previous lap by a second. Now there, 57 BMW, Will Burns at the wheel of it. He's about to try and make a move against the... Assetto Ginetta, Mark Sansom at the wheel of it, and this is going to get very, very close. Behind them is John Ferguson in the Toyota. That's Loggy for the lead. I would say he's just extended that a smidge over I go. So the Lamborghinis certainly have been quick, but the uh, number six Mercedes has a drive-through penalty for a pit exit violation, a drive-through penalty for the leading car pit exit violation. And that, as they say, changes everything then, because that is potentially 25 points going begging. They should still score something, but their chances of winning the race now, unfortunately, looking rather remote. The GT4 field then very close together as they come out of the Britain chicane. That's Harry Hayek there in the number four car with Chris Salkeld ahead. Remember, the nine car has to win the class in this race to prevent the 57 car from taking the title. That's not going to happen at the moment. The 57 car is a few places further up the road, but this group is all getting a bit congested behind Mark Sanders Sansom in the Ginetta. Remember, Sansom is a bronze-graded AM driver surrounded here, for the most part at least, by silver-graded drivers who you would expect to have a bit of an advantage. And of course, those silver cup cars, their extra success or their extra time they have to spend in the pit lane sort of negated by this safety car. The team manager of the Adam Ballon Lamborghini to the race director now. So, one penalty hits the screen. There might be another one in the pipeline here, as we have now just under 20 minutes of the race to go. Mark Sanson is being caught by John Ferguson. John has done many a lap around here in Formula 4 1600s, hasn't he? But now in the Toyota, he is trying to push forward. 
Now, that car is, of course, dropping down within GT4. So, is he being ultra cautious in the wet or has he got a problem? Because certainly, compared to how Jamie Caroline was going early on, they've lost a big chunk of places. Uh, yeah, but as I was just making the point about Sansom, Ferguson is an AM driver and he's got all of these silver graded drivers who are, in theory, quicker than him all over him. So, it will be a little tricky. He does seem quicker, though, doesn't he, than Sansom ahead. So, uh, as far as the other drivers of a similar sort of speed to him, he does seem to be pretty strong. The answer to why is Ian Loggy serving a drive-through is because the car was pulled back, it drove away, and then it slowed and then accelerated uh, once it got to the pit lane exit line. So it was a go and slow, which you're not really allowed to do to try to make sure that they weren't under on the pit stop time. Big, big battle here and a bit of contact as well. The BMW almost gets wiped around the front of the uh, Harry Hyatt McLaren there, but they all survived that. This is GT4. And this is a drama just waiting to happen. <laughs> yeah, two places lost, well, three places lost there for Hyatt because Salkel was passing him when they had contact and then that delayed the McLaren when they did hit each other. And so through goes Will Moore in the Mustang and Ashley Marshall in the McLaren. Ferguson up to have another go now at Mark Sansom as they drop down into the Hislop chicane. This for fourth place in GT4, but for the lead of the GT4 Pro-Am class. So through they battle once more. There, number 61, Matt Cowley in the uh, mighty Mustang. Uh, sorry, now Will Moore at the wheel of that car, isn't it? The Cowley Moore car, which had its starter motor dramas in the opening race. So we've now got number six Mercedes having served its drive through. Michael Igo, therefore, takes over the lead. There is the Mercedes of Ram Racing, which goes back into the race. Ian Loggy will be mighty frustrated, and that's going to bring him back onto the road just ahead of the McLarens. Yeah, that's Tilbrook first, I think, isn't it? In the Enduro car, yes, yeah. it is. And no further action against number one. Ah, OK. So. I'm guessing then that is because he did stall and it was decided that it was driver error rather than the team trying to pull a fast one, if you see what I mean. So, uh, and they were still, they were eight seconds over their minimum pit stop time. So it was never a question of the pit stop being too short or whether they broke a, a procedural rule in the process, if you see what I mean. So right now we have the number 18 Lamborghini into the lead of the race and Adam Ballon in number one up into second. But right now Leo Machitsky is under attack, isn't he? Because another of the locals, Richard Neary, hunting him down as they make the run up towards the crest of the rise over Hilltop. 17 minutes are still on the clock and Leo Machitsky's car dropping away from Nick Jones because he's having to defend. So Leo Machitsky will want as many points as he can. He's not going to roll over and wave people by. Equally, he does not want to get himself in strife and risk going off the road. Yeah, good pace this from Richard Neary, though. He's one of only a handful of drivers in the 1 minute 49. Certainly the uh, two cars ahead of him, Nick Jones's Porsche and Leo Machitsky's Lamborghini in the mid to high 1 minute 50. So Richard's got nearly a second or over a second a lap in hand over the two cars ahead. But of course, again, now he's caught the Lamborghini. He can't really see anything. He's in this big ball of spray, and that means uh, making the overtake is increasingly difficult. You can see the way it closes in. I do hope they keep this black livery on that number eight Mercedes. It looks really, really menacing with the headlights ablaze burning through the spray as they come across the start finish line to start lap number 22. Is there a gap into Old Hall? Not really, but you can just see how much more speed Richard can carry into the corners. That Mercedes working well. Yeah, the green was really a carryover from the roll centre days when roll centre ran the car, wasn't it? Uh, into GT4, meantime, McLaren's at play as they battle their way through. James Kell ahead of uh, Michael Benyard. Then you've got Will Burns and next up Mark Sanson. So that's for the lead, the McLarens of Kell and Benyard and John Ferguson there losing out because up on the inside of him goes Chris Solkelt. Now they cross swords at Brown's Hatch, remember, at the start of the season, but the Supra, I'm afraid, is slipping down the order. Admittedly, these are not ideal conditions, but John Ferguson is struggling. Oh, and off no. the road goes Neary and bang into the tar barrier. Richard Neary off the road. Our cameraman stands his ground about as bravely as he possibly can, thinking that's a big heavy car heading my way. But Richard Neary is back on the road, but he will have cost himself time and places. Uh, yeah, so he was challenging, wasn't he, for that uh, fourth place at the time, but unfortunately uh, made a mistake by the looks of it up at the hairpin. This is the car that he was attacking. Uh, I see no evidence of new damage on the back of the 63 car, <laughs> so I don't think they made contact, but we'll see if we can get that confirmed. And, of course, that now promotes Ian Loggy back in the place, doesn't it? Because yeah. Loggy had rejoined the circuit after his penalty in sixth, so he was the next car behind these two. It's all go, isn't it? <laughs> it has been all day, really, hasn't yeah. it? <laughs> so Michael Igo leads from Adam Ballard. Now, 3.3 seconds is the leading margin, 
And last time around, Michael Igo's car was quicker, and that's a, side, a sliding Samson, uh, clipping the curve as well. So Mark Samson in the Ginetta accelerates up towards Hilltop. Chris Solkeld is getting quicker and quicker all the time in the BMW. But James Kell and Michael Benyaya for RJN, the uh, McLaren squad leading the way. Will Moore in the Mustang also inching up onto the back of these two. John Ferguson, in the meantime, is falling back, isn't he, in the Toyota Supra. Ian Loggy, by the way, fifth now. He's just benefited from that incident for Richard Neary, so that in turn has given him a place back. Uh, no contact, by the way, it's been reported by the Neary's, so that was uh, an off all by himself for Richard, unfortunately. Ginetta here of uh, Mark Sanson then, with Chris Salkeld right behind him. Salkeld, the silver-graded driver again, looking to try and find a way through. But he's kind of split that pro-am battle now, hasn't he? As you said, he's got ahead of the Toyota and now looks to try and clear the Ginetta. Ginetta, of course, still hold the lap record in GT4 around here at Alton Park from something like seven years ago. We, there was some speculation it might get beaten today, but uh, that ain't going to happen in these conditions. There is the Toyota. Look, it's lost another place, actually. Yeah. Ferguson now slipping behind another silver-graded driver in the shape of Ashley Marshall. An incident involving uh, Katie Milner and Chris Solkeld to be investigated after the race. So that number nine BMW has had quite a lot of investigation post-race. because There was one with Andrew Gordon Colebrook in the first, and now Chris Solkeld in the second, the former Ginetta race. And there he is, powering his way out of Cascades. 13 minutes on the clock. Track conditions still horrendous, and fair play to everybody who's kept it off the black bit. Uh, yeah, again, pretty good driving standards so far, you'd have to say, in very, very difficult conditions. Let's hope that continues for the remaining 13 minutes of the race then. Sansom continuing to defend. He's got the BMW behind and then the Ford Mustang, which uh, we were chatting at uh, Snetterton, weren't we, last time? Like, you wouldn't think would be good in the wet, and yet it really was strong and, of course, got that victory uh, in the second race at Snetterton last time out. It is uh, former Formula Ford star... Uh, at the wheel, oh, no, sorry, it's Will Moore in the car for this second stint, of course, Van Cowley did the first stint, and he's watching on as this battle takes place in front of him, Salkel to the outside of Sansom, it's debris from someone there goes flying in the air, that might have been off the Ginetta, which loses a place now to the BMW around the outside into his lobs. One of the rare opportunities to get a pass done on the outside, so well done, Chris Salkel, that worked out nicely. Yeah, I think the Mustang, it's a bit like the Mercedes, isn't it, because it's got that big grunty engine, it's in the front, and you don't have to as there you see Loggy carving his way back ahead of Machitsky then, so that gives him fourth place. It's an easier car to drive than one of the turbocharged cars, for example, uh, and all of that grunt just helps you. You can ease the car on the throttle and, and, and the torque does some of the work for you. I think that's why the Mustang and the Mercedes in GT3 terms score around here. There, Ian Loggy. I tell you what, for a guy that had to give up the race lead, he is very fired up, but he's not throwing good at the scenery. The spray might be there, but the red mist isn't. Uh, well, and we expected this car to go well if it rained. He's about five seconds behind Nick Jones, who he should be quicker than. So that could be still a podium position on the cards. And with every position he gains, more valuable points going his way. As it stands, for example, he would be joint second place in the championship here in Young Verb would be anyway, uh, with the WPI car of Keane and Igo. So uh, if he can make more progress here, he could be even closer then to the 63 car going to the decider at Donington in a few weeks' time. Back in GT4, meanwhile, this is for the race lead, isn't it? it is. the, uh, the, the RJN squad that haven't really had a brilliant season suddenly have two cars fighting for the race victory. Yeah, and that's almost come out of nowhere, hasn't it? Because we weren't talking about them in the first stint. And here is James Kell. I did suggest that James had become a much, much better driver over the last 12 months, a bit more experience, and maybe uh, the, the fact that he's working here with people with lots of experience and part of a, a programme and a, a good, experienced team. Bob Neville that runs Team RJN. A uh, hugely experienced team principal and race engineer and racer himself, raced for a time in the BTCC, for example. Uh, maybe all that's helping to get the best out of James Kell. But as the McLarens are squabbling, they need to be mindful, don't they? Because Will Burns is heading closer and closer and closer. Yeah, I mean, Will is... He probably doesn't really want to get too involved with these two. He's in a championship-winning position as it is. He doesn't need to pass these two. But he's faster than them. On the previous lap, Kel and Benyaya were in the sort of low to mid. Well, actually, Kel did a 56-2, Benyaya 55-7, Burns a 55-6. So he is the faster of these three by quite some way. And Kel leading the group is the slowest of this group. So they're all going to bunch together. And that's going to give Will Burns a bit of a headache here going into the final sort of, well, now less than 10 minutes. Indeed. So as there over the timing line goes James Kel. Michael Benyar still chasing after him. Will Burns, champion-elect, inching up onto the back of them as they now turn through Old Hall Corner. There's more standing water there. Oh, there's just a few more big puddles offline, but 
in the gloom, in the rain, in the spray. They drop down towards Cascades. Michael Igo, by the way, now 3.8 seconds ahead of Adam Ballon. Fastest lap of the race, still that of Marcus Clatton from earlier on, which is a commendable effort in the McLaren. Uh, yeah, definitely. 45.0, some three or four seconds faster than anyone is going at the moment, even though, uh, well, I suppose that was the pro stint, wasn't it, in yeah. the uh, first part of the race? But, uh, yeah, impressive stuff from Marcus at his home race. GT4 leaders up through the shell head, and that's Mark Sansom off at Cascades, and that will now lose him even more ground, I'm afraid, in the Assetto Motorsport Ginetta that was robbed so cruelly of that victory at Brands Hatch at the season opener, and really since then they haven't been able yeah. to catch a break, and uh, that doesn't change here today. No, big shame, that. So, See how he did it, just breaks late, doesn't he? Runs out of road, slides, catches it just about. I think the gravel helps to bring the car back onto the approximate right line. But the car is still going, which is good news, as now the fight's on here for third place. Nick Jones ahead oh. of an inspired Ian Loggy. Jones goes wide. Thank you very much, says Ian Loggy. The pink pound for pounces, doesn't it? Because through it goes, the uh, black and pink Mercedes looks a bit like a bruise, really, with that livery, but through it has gone, or dark blue rather than black and pink, but it goes through, gains the place, and Ian Loggy absolutely charging. This is a really impressive stint. It's a shame that third might be as good as it gets, really. Uh, yes, but that would at least put him only just over 10 points off the championship lead now, going to the decider, and that's if Igo keeps it on the road for the race victory, which uh, he should do. He's four seconds clear nearly of Adam Ballard in second place, but this is the car that's now into third position, so Ian Loggy really good fight back this a case of what could have been had they not had the penalty but if you're going to get a penalty and still you can bounce back onto the podium that is uh, really not a bad result to take from the race the team manager of the number nine bmw that chris olkeld's car is having to go to see the race director so there might be yet another story brewing in the gt4 conversation uh, 88 incidentally tom onslow cole's dramas the car did get going again as we had seen but because it is three laps down, it is in last place, 23rd place. And the Matt Topper Maston that was victorious in the first race is now last on the lead lap, if you like. It's the last of those that hasn't had a problem. So I think Matt Topham is finding these conditions rather tougher. Yeah, because although they had that 10 second success penalty, they should really have lost a huge amount of time to the Silver Cup car, should they? No, so, uh, yeah, that's uh, either a mistake or he is just lacking pace a little bit out on circuit at the moment. We're right on board with the 57 car then, the car that is now just seven minutes away from provisionally being crowned the GT4 overall champion and I would imagine as well the GT4 Silver Cup champion. They had an even bigger lead uh, in the Silver Cup ranks coming into this weekend, but they still have to try and survive. They've still got to try and make sure they get to the end of the race. And with these squabbling McLarens up the road, and they really are squabbling and they make contact through Nickerbrook Corner. The teammates, remember, making contact through Nickerbrook. Thankfully, the position doesn't change hands. Kel holds onto the advantage and they can hardly believe it at Century because now their car is second as they head over Clay Hill. Michael Benyar has a case to answer there, doesn't he? Because he very nearly wiped out his teammate and he's cost himself a place as well. So that was a little bit ambitious, wasn't it? James Kell did well to ha hang on to all of that. The door might have been ajar, but it certainly wasn't open. And that now means that number 57 BMW not only is up to second, but it looks like he's got the pace to challenge for the class win. And I think he will go for it, to be honest. I think Will Burns is going to have a go at this. Up the hill we go. 10 seconds stop go penalty, meanwhile, for the number nine car. So I was about to make the point that if these three all went off, then the nine car would inherit the lead. Not anymore. 10 seconds stop go penalty for causing a collision, I'm afraid. So Chris Salkeld will be heading for the pit lane very shortly. Yeah, that was with Katie Milner. So right now, 57 BMW, Will Burns at the wheel of it, accelerates onto the back of James Kell as they drop downhill. You were looking a moment ago at uh, the co-driver Gus Burton in the pit lane, watching the screen, seeing what's going on. And what is going on right now is that that gap is coming down and down and down. And where out of all of that has the Michael Benyaya McLaren dropped to? It looks like it's picked up enough damage to really drop it a lot of time because it's no longer in the shot, is it? It's, in fact, has that car pitted? No, but it's got a problem. It's dropped 10 seconds in the first sector. Maybe it's got a puncture as a legacy of the contact. But now, number three McLaren is absolutely out of the hunt. And right now, 57 BMW is going to secure the championship in the best possible way by going for a win. That's the way to do it, isn't it? If yeah. you can win the race, that is uh, that is really the way to be crowned the champion as they head down then through his lops uh, into the right-left chicane. 
did just spot Leo Machitsky on the tail of Nick Jones for fourth place within GT3, but it's sideways for the GT4 leader there. And uh, that was a big, big save for James Kell, who so desperately wants to try and get a race victory here. This number two car, which uh, didn't even race remember at Spa because they had a big crash. James, in fact, was the one that had a shunt uh, in the test session before the weekend even really started. Uh, and that really did properly derail their season. And now here they are four and a half minutes away from a race win. In other news, the Bentley, uh, Kelvin Fletcher is in the pits, looking as though that's retirement, possibly after an off. The reason that Michael Benyar has dropped out of this battle is because he ran wide at Cascades, and that's where he's lost the time. But right now, looking very, very strong here, is Will Burns as he comes up to attack James Kell. So the one-time touring car racer commits to the inside line as they come down towards Old Hall Corner. This for GT4 honors. The BMW should get the job done. It's got the tighter line. It's got the lead. Through goes Will Burns. James Kell's getting it hung out to dry on the outside over the kerb. And Will Burns has done it, and they are delighted at Century Motorsport. Nathan Freak puts an arm around Gus Burton because they know that unless the car drops off the race, Track. That is the championship done and dusted. Yes, because the only car that could have stopped them is in the pit lane serving a 10 second stop go right now as well. So uh, Chris Salkeld has pitted in the number nine car from fourth place. Uh, it is sort of fitting, to be honest, that they're going to win the championship here with a race victory because yeah. they have just been the dominant force. It will be their third victory of the season. It will be, though, their sixth podium finish from eight races within the GT4 category. And when you factor in all of these success penalties and the Silver Cup penalty as well, the different conditions we've had to face over the season, to have that sort of a hit rate is mighty, mighty impressive. There's Ben Yaya then, still going but coming under renewed attack because right there behind him is the Mustang of Will Moore and also you'll see Ashley Marshall in the bow for McLaren, the green and white car there. The sort of spearmint, so as they come up now towards Britain, a flash of the lights from Will Moore to try and distract Michael Benyard. So whereas a little while ago he was fighting for a class lead, now he's trying to hang on to a podium place within that and the car clearly has suffered a, a, as a legacy of that contact because it's dropping so much time now. Yeah, and you can see the way that, uh, oh dear me, more bodywork goes flying there on the run into his lots. We've got three McLarens together here, two of the RJN cars, and then you've got this green and white Balf Motorsport car that won at Spa a month or so ago. Really now trying to find a way past the Ford Mustang ahead. These are all Silver Cup entrants as well, so this all matters for uh, Silver Cup points too. Uh, incidentally, we haven't seen it because we've quite rightly been focusing on the GT4 battles, but Leo Machitsky is now fourth ahead of Nick Jones. That's right. an extra couple of championship points for the GT3 points leader. Yeah, they were close. They got them nose to tail. Right, time to get the new t-shirts on. Century Motorsport are the champions and 57 BMW have just gone storming over the liners down towards Lodge Corner. To the outside line goes Will Moore. Michael Benyard tries to fend him off on the inside line but the grunt and go Mustang will easily go around the outside there. That was a good pass by Will Moore and against the torque helps. Uh, yeah, and the traction from that wider line too, which just has a lot more grip. We've seen a few drivers using that over the course of the race. And now look, the three McLaren just about fending off the uh, Ashley Marshall <laughs> car into Old Hall. And who's behind them as he starts his last lap of the race? Michael Igo. Uh -huh. I reckon the chequered flag will just about be out at the end. It's going to be tight, this. But if Michael Igo backs off a little, A, to avoid the traffic, and B, he will secure this as being the last lap of the race. And that is Ballon, isn't it, who's had a moment? Adam Ballon off the road at Old Hall Corner. He's had a spin, and has he lost a place? Where's Ian Loggy? He's not yet caught him. Yeah, so Loggy's still third then, but blimey, that is not what Adam Ballon needed. Uh, if I were WPI Motorsport, though, I'd be getting straight on the radio to Mike Ligo to tell him that, because yeah. there is absolutely no need to force the issue with the traffic now. Just bring it home, make this the final lap. So easy to imagine, isn't it, that the car could get a tap or a, a bit of a knock from a GT4 car. Ballon went round all on his own look through Old Hall Corner and did well not to stall the car or hit anything or get stuck in the mud and get going again in second position because again that is a car that needs all the points they can get over the top of hilltop though comes mike ligo he's got probably one more back marker to negotiate here uh, and that 61 car which is running third place there now in gt4 should hopefully be the last bit of traffic for Igo to deal with yeah just back off now michael you don't have to attack bring it home race control confirming to us that this is the last lap 27 seconds on the clock up through the approach to Druids, there's confirmation on the screen. So Michael Igo, who really only has one setting, and that needs to really push, is underlining it, but the flag is imminent. And so heading then towards the end of the eighth round of the Intelligent Money British GT Championship. They won at the start of the year, but it's been a long time between wins for Michael Igo and Phil Keane. But the Lamborghini comes down towards Lodge Corner. A soggy checkered flag is at the ready. And after another very eventful race at Alton Park, 
Michael Igo and Phil Keane win in the Lamborghini run by WPI Motorsport. A really good drive in pretty horrible conditions. In GT4, they come pouring over the line uh, with Will Moore ahead of Ashley Marshall, ahead of Michael Benyaya, then Harry Hayek and Richard Williams, the Audi falling away as well. Uh, Adam Ballon has just come through to take second place and Ian Loggy set for third for Ram Racing, the squad the team, Ram Racing, that won the earlier race. Ian Loggy comes through, but for his drive-through penalty, it could have been a very different story. But in the end, Michael Igo and Phil Keane take win number two of their season. Adam Ballon and Sandy Mitchell second, despite a spin. And third goes the way of Ian Loggy and Yelma Berman after a drive-through penalty. Leo Machitsky and Dennis Lynn take fourth. Nick Jones and Scott Morgan fifth. Morgan Tilbrook and Marcus Clatton come home in sixth place. A very eventful day. Now, what about GT4, Andy? The top two have not yet got home. Uh, no, they haven't actually, have they? Will Burns had a 3.4 second lead over James Kell going on to what was their final lap. And all he needs to do is bring it home now. And they will be provisionally your GT4 champions. Here they are. Look, he actually doesn't have to finish the race because even if this car didn't finish, the nine car had to win. But they'll want to bring it home with a race win with their third checkered flag of the 2021 season. And this is a rare occurrence then, not for, what was it, about six years have we had a British GT champion crowned before finals day. But out of Lodge Corner then comes Will Burns, and he and Gus Burton and the Century Motorsport squad are provisionally your GT4 champions. Across the line they go, and I think they will be very, very <laughs> happy with that. The smile says it all. Absolutely. A delighted Gus Burton. Nathan Freak, who... Of course, runs the team with his father, Clive, race winner himself and single-seaters as well as in GT cars. But that's a really good job done. And it further strengthens the case, if you like, for Century with BMW UK. Because, of course, BMW looks at touring cars. But after the success that Century has had, they could do worse than look at GT4 racing as well. And GT4, we've said this this year a few times, is really starting to take off now. You look across Europe and GT4 is sort of becoming the category to be in. And, uh, yeah, it would be really nice to get some manufacturer involvement. So let's have a look at the provisional result then. There are one or two uh, incidents still being looked at, but Phil Keane and Michael Igo win at Alton Park from Sandy Mitchell and Adam Ballon. Ian Loggy and Yelma Berman are third ahead of Dennis Lind and Leo Machitsky with Scott Mulvan and Nick Jones clear of Morgan Tilbrook and Marcus Clatton. GT4 won by Will Burns and Gus Burton from Jordan Collard and James Kell. Will Moore and Matt Cowley coming home in third place. So a Lamborghini 1-2, different teams, Mercedes 3, Lamborghini 4, Porsche 5, McLaren 6, and BMW coming out on top in GT4. And at the end of all of that, although one car withdrew before the start, we only lost one, and it was the Bentley that started in the pits and retired to the pits. So the rest of them, despite the conditions, did a pretty decent job. The one car that was in strife and brought out the safety car, Tom Onslow, Cole, and Kevin Says, race one winning Mercedes. And interesting that it wasn't Kevin, the Alton Park rookie that had the off. That was 20 seconds, three laps down, but uh, giving both of them more track time and uh, a bittersweet day, a win and a drama, but at least the car remains undamaged. So, uh, Phil Keane and Michael Igo delighted. There is Phil Keane. Michael Igo, who has done a lot of racing in a relatively short space of time, has become a, a real star of British GT racing, hasn't he? And these two have really gelled as well. You know, Michael had a few different co-drivers last year. He settled on Phil Keane. I mean, not a bad bloke to have in the car with you, let's be honest. And they really seem to get on really well. You know, I see them chatting uh, uh, away from the track, sort of queuing up for an ice cream together yesterday afternoon when we had rather different weather to this. They get on well. They clearly have driving styles that gel well together. That's really important when you're sharing a car. You know, you want someone that enjoys the same things out of a setup as you do, for example. And they will go to the final round of the championship with a, a chance at the title. I reckon, provisionally, we'll get confirmation of this, I'm sure, in a moment, there will be five teams that could still win the GT3 championship going to the Donington decider. So it's, it's going to be another one of those races you don't want to miss. Absolutely. Funny, isn't it, though, because as we've been making the point, GT4 is sewn up, yet it's had good grids all year, great variety all season as well but what a win for Phil Keane and Michael Igo they can tell all to Bryn Lucas quite a, a long time coming that one hey it was, uh, you had a win at Brands Hatch it's been a long long wait did you think you'd have to wait this long um, no to be honest we're, we're, we've had quite an up and down season as you all know um, but yeah I think that one was well deserved it was on the cards and I knew as, start as, it, uh, as soon as it started to rain that the car works well and I actually prefer to drive in the rain so there we go
really happy for the team. Michael prefers driving in the rain. Phil, what about you? Yeah, I mean, I, I don't mind either way, really, but uh, it's always good fun in the rain. But no, the, the guys, the team did a great job with the pit stop and Michael drove really well at the end there. So, uh, yeah, well deserved to the guys. Now, I know the championship is not over until the fat lady sings, but for you two, was it just about getting a stamp, putting a marker down to prove that you can win races here? Um, yeah, as you say, it's not over until the Battle Lady sings, so let's keep pushing. There's a lot can happen yet. There's 37 and a half points to go uh, with the last round coming up. So uh, let's see what happens. There's, there's lots, lots ahead. So one month to collect your thoughts and go again. Yeah, that's yeah. what it looks like. <laughs> oh, good luck, you two. Cheers, thank, you. thank you. Well done, Michael Igo and Phil Keane. Excellent job done. Now, what about this? Century Motorsport wins the race, wins the championship, and with a round to spare. They cannot almost not believe it by the looks of it, but there is the moment as Will Burns gets out of the car, greeted by his co-driver Gus Burton. And I made this point after race one, but the season that this team endured last year, they kind of they got a victory at the season decider last year at Silverstone, but that was kind of a strategic win. They got a bit lucky uh, towards the end of the race. They, by their own admission, were not the fastest team out there last season. They came here this year with the updated version now of this car and. Uh, and it really seems to have transformed the whole team. They, they were the fastest, really, right off the bat. Yeah, and Will Burns, I think, in fairness to him, has also developed as a driver over the last few years. You know, he, he raced in the Castle Coombs Saloon Car Championship, he got through Ginettas, went into the British Touring Car Championship, which was a really tough thing to go and race in, especially for what was one of the top teams. But here, he's quietly got on with the job, and he's developed as a driver, and he's had a team that's worked with him. And this is kind of his his racing. He, he, he looks a very good GT prospect, whereas perhaps you wouldn't have necessarily backed him as a touring car star of the future. But new GT4 champions, uh, an excellent job. Gus Burton and Will Burns. They're with Bren. I don't know what to say. Do I congratulate you for the race win or for the championship win? Which one first? Well, congratulations. Off you go. Uh, well, I couldn't see anything. My heated screen wasn't working at the end of that. So I saw a bit of contact between the, the front two and then I just managed to get overtake one of them. I don't know what, what car it was. And then I saw James Kerr was like, a little bit like sliding all over the place and I just managed to just get a good run out of Lodge. But Obviously, Anna's champions as well, so what an amazing day. <laughs> Do you know, it's been an incredible, incredible season. Andy was saying three wins, six podiums out of the eight races. I mean, that's unheard of, really. Yeah, yeah. You know, we've, had a good, we've had a really good year, and uh, the car's been great. Century have done a great job uh, getting that car set up right for us. Um, and the strategies have just been amazing as well, uh, hence why we brought the car home every race. Um, yeah, over the moon, champion. This guy did a great job in that race. Um, so yeah, now it's time to celebrate. But then you've got to come back in a month's time and have another race. And is that going to be another race win? What's your, the way you're going to really focus on that one, is it? Well, we're going to have a few um, drunk nights before then, <laughs> so I'm not really worried about that race just yet. But obviously the guys have done an amazing job. Just obviously Gus has done a fantastic job as well. Obviously we were competitors last year and we also worked together and now we're like great friends. So obviously awesome job. <laughs> Great friends and champions. Yeah, perfect. Yeah. <laughs> Congratulations, guys. Well oh, done. Cheers. There you go, Andy and David. Back to you. Brian, thank you very much indeed. So, very happy BMW squad and uh, happy GT fans, in a sense, because it'll go down to the wire in GT3. And, Andy, it looks like this. Uh, it does. 147 points then for Dennis Lind and Leo Machitsky. Uh, puts them 13 and a half points clear of Ian Loggie and Yelma Berman. What could have been if Loggie and Berman had won that race? They in turn are three points ahead of Michael Igo and Phil Keane, uh, with then Adam Ballon and Sandy Mitchell. With Andrew Howard still mathematically in contention for the title. Remember, Johnny Adam had to miss Spa, so he cannot win it. Uh, and so Johnny will once again find himself in that position he's been in before, going to the final round to try and win his teammate a championship, which they have done once or twice before. Indeed so. And uh, with Phil Keane having another victory and Johnny not having had one this year, it increases, of course, the um, strike rate for Phil Keane within the championship. He's got more wins, but he's not yet been a champion. Whereas Johnny Adam keeps winning championships, but hasn't had a win this year. But Dennis Lind and Leo Machitsky working well together as a partnership, and uh, they are in charge in GT3. And we have still, of course, another round of the championship to look forward to at Donington Park before the end of the season. Well, I'll tell you what, a wet Alton Park could have been absolute carnage, but as it turned out, he gave us another excellent race and 
probably the best GT racing we've had over the course of a day here for many a season. And two very different races. Yeah. The first one being dry, all action, really high paced, but really, really close racing. And then race two, we got more of the same close racing in spite, really, of the really dreadful conditions out there. And I think it is, you know, you said this after race one, it's a testament to the drivers out there that that could have been, as you said, a recipe for disaster, and yet it really wasn't. We've had two really clean races that have still managed to be really exciting. That first race this earlier on this afternoon, one of the best we've seen in yeah, years. Yeah. And uh, yeah, that is the kind of racing this championship has always been capable of producing, and I hope we get it again at Donington later this year. But we've had worse driving in better weather <laughs> yes. than you saw in race two, for example, over the years. Uh, but a uh, fascinating race, and I know penalties played a part in all of that, but uh, it's all part and parcel of GT racing, and uh, when there are regulations for pit stops and the like, then you've got to adhere to them, and some did and some didn't, and that's how we partly got to the outcome of what was uh, another enthralling second race. There's still racing on track at Alton Park. In the background of the shot, you'll see Formula Fords making their way round uh, on the circuit for their last race. But there we have the drivers being readied for the podium. And Yelma Berman and Ian Loggy, who smiles despite the penalty, step forward onto the podium here at Alton Park. <laughs> Very soggy Mark Werrell there, not particularly happy to be out in the rain conducting the podium ceremonies. Uh, but yes, uh, great result nonetheless, despite the penalty there for Loggy and Berman. That's their fourth podium of the season, so again, not a bad hit rate for them, really. Uh, then you've got uh, Adam Ballon and Sandy Mitchell. Uh, they, too, have been on the podium a number of occasions this season. That's their fourth appearance there. But it is the victory for WPI Motorsport, as you said, their first one since Brands Hatch at the start of the year. Had that weird period, didn't they, around Silverstone, Donington, where the car just wasn't working quite right. But they will be third in the points going to the Donington decider. Uh, yeah, some of that not working was put down to a legacy of the damage, wasn't it, at, at Donington? But they bounced back here, home circuit, and a win for Michael Igo on home soil. And uh, again, whether it would have been a different result with Sandy Mitchell and Adam Ballon having two new sets of slicks saved for the second race, well, we'll never know. A wet Alton Park, but Phil Keane takes yet another win. And Michael Igo, his co-driver, putting them both back into the hunt for the championship. Yelma Berman all smiles. Go back, gosh, 21 years. Yelma's father was racing at the equivalent meeting and being on the podium in one of the support races for remember the old Marcos GT Challenge. And his father was, was in that, got on the podium. But Yelma, who raced here in Formula Renault and Formula 3, remains one of the stars in the Mercedes, doesn't he? Yeah, and always has been good in the wet. I remember uh, sitting at Nickerbrook a few years ago, a very soggy Nickerbrook as it was then, watching him absolutely charging on and, and so much faster than anybody else out on track. He, in that car, in these conditions, really is magic, isn't he? Uh, then we've got our Pro-Am podium, which is, uh, once again, going to be a family affair, the Proctors and the Neerys. Uh, the Neerys, uh, they could have probably had a little bit more out of today. I know they sort of inherited the race win points from race one, but then that spin for Richard when he was looking strong uh, in the second race, unfortunately, robbed them of a better overall result. But it is still the GT3 Pro-Am victory for them, and uh, that will uh, help them out a little bit in the, uh, in the points. And uh, the Neary's good to have them back, isn't it? They, of course, go to Donington Park now, where they won their first ever race earlier on this year. That's right. And then they have the drama at Spa. It's been a real roller coaster of a season. You see on uh, Sam's overalls, the BRDC Rising Stars badge, one of the two uh, programmes that the club operates to nurture young British talent. Now, what about GT4? That has given us drama all day. And Will Moore and Matt Cowley from the Ford Mustang Academy Motorsport squad step forward onto the podium for third place. You know, I think the very first event I ever commentated on was a, a BRSCC club meeting here in Alton Park, and Matt Cowley was racing in Formula Ford that day, and to see him now uh, one of the faster drivers within the British GT4 Championship, it's nice to see drivers progressing through club racing and, uh, and sort of starting to really achieve things now in motorsport. James Kell, another example of that, but uh, these are the men of the moment, Will Burns and Gus Burton, your champions in 2021 in GT4, and notch up another race victory. Will said it best actually I think in his interview there with Bryn winning races and being on the podium is great but they are the only GT4 pairing that have scored points in every race this year and that ultimately is what's won them the championship and also let's be fair a lot of good people behind the scenes at Century Motorsport Nathan and Clive Freak's team have worked well on those cars they've been reliable they've been durable the drivers have kept out of trouble they've had a very very good season it's been a, a good 
team effort. Yes, the guys behind the wheel have done a grand job, but so have those that have engineered the cars and looked after the strategy, made sure the pit stops have been good. And now, if they can't beat them on the track, they'll beat them on the podium. Gus Burton has never been as wet, but he doesn't care a bit. No, I don't think anything is going to wipe the smile off his face, is it? And uh, I've said this before, though, if you go early with the champagne, you leave yourself defenceless then when the uh, when the others uncork it. But I think he might well be uh, having another bottle or two later on tonight to celebrate. And why shouldn't they? A fantastic way to quite end the season for them. Uh, but certainly they will go to Donington Park with no pressure. And that is a rare feeling, really, uh, for a team in this championship. So they're going to enjoy every second of that final round. Darren Turner with a big grin on his face there, having won the first race. Charlie Robertson just over his shoulder in the Assetto Motorsport Ginetta. That's been a tough season for the Assetto squad. You've made the point they were so close to a win at uh, Brands, but not again. But now the Pro-Ams out of GT4, Matt Topham and Darren Turner. A win and a third, not a bad day in class. Uh, no, not at all. And uh, they will be uh, second, I think, now in the GT4 points going to the final round. That is actually going to be quite an interesting battle because that car, the number nine BMW, the number two McLaren, they're all going to be quite tight on points actually uh, for second place within GT4. So the championship might have been wrapped up, but there are still uh, a few positions left to fight for. And there, Assetto uh, will get themselves up onto their class podium within GT4. Nice to get the nice to see them get a bit of silver. Yeah, they're still yeah. though looking for their first outright podium in GT4 this season, would you believe? That's right. So the uh, team of Simon Traves and Jim Edwards Jr., Assetto Motorsport, Simon who splits his time between running Ginettas and racing his own Brisker F1 stock car, as you do, uh, but uh, a Pro-Am win. John Ferguson's not hanging about for this, you know, and uh, he and Jamie Caroline Scarper, Matt Topham, Darren Turner versus Charlie Robertson and uh, Mark Sampson on the podium, but uh, oh, come on, Mark, hero time, he's got there now. Bangs the bottle on the floor and off he sets, but uh, some excellent racing across the classes, across the subcategories within the two divisions as well. And uh, yeah, Alton Park and GT racing have often given us too many incidents, but today just great racing. Uh, yeah, absolutely. And they've given us some champions as well. Gus Burton and Will Burns then provisionally are your GT4 champions. James Kell and Jordan Collard then will move into second place. But look at how tight it is. They're six and a half points ahead of Andrew Gordon, Colbrook and Chris Salkeld, uh, who in turn are only nine and a half ahead of Darren Turner and Matt Topham. So a three-way fight for second in the class. Uh, that's going to be pretty entertaining going to Donington. It is indeed. So well done, Gus Burton and Will Burns as the champions. And well done to Century Motorsport for running a very good BMW program all season long. So two excellent races at Alton Park and with battles, with penalties, with the weather conditions, we were kept guessing right to the very end, weren't we? And as ever, there are some hard luck stories. Uh, one of the good stories, we've just touched on it, the Century Motorsport, a victory out of race two. Another is that Tom Onslow, local Kevin Say win out of race one, uh, not scoring points, but Kevin coming to Alton Park for the first time and taking a race win. Very, very impressive indeed. So the rain continues to fall and what has been a big crowd actually for a, a Sunday at Alton Park have been treated apart from the rain to some really good racing over the course of the day. And uh, we look forward to seeing how the championship pans out at Donington next month. So uh, still a few uh, conversations yeah. going on there down on the podium, aren't they, as uh, drivers are uh, just uh, chatting about what they've been up to today. An awful lot has happened over the course of the uh, the two races, and uh, it's something that drivers like to do almost more than drive the cars is, is talk about driving the cars and telling each other what happened to them in that race and all of the near misses they had and the good battles that they had. And uh, it's uh, quite a nice part of this paddock, actually, for such a high-profile championship. There is quite a nice relationship, for the most part, between the teams and drivers. And uh, from a social point of view, they do all sort of enjoy getting together for a, for a bit of a natter after the race. So at the end of race two, let's have a look back at exactly what happened with uh, an extra formation lap before the cars were released. And as the field dived down towards Old Hall Corner, it was Scott Mulvan then that assumed the race lead in the Team Parker Racing Porsche with... Uh, Dennis Lynn slotting in behind in second spot. The cars tiptoed their way, with most of the cars having a pro at the helm, out of Old Hall Corner. Phil Keane making his way up through the traffic, putting a move against Tom Onslow Cole. But Sandy Mitchell was one of the stars of that early stint, getting himself onto the back of Dennis Lynn as the cars ran through 
Lodge corner. They were also being chased hard by Yelma Berman. And the good battle was going on in GT4. Senna Fielding moving up on the inside of Darren Turner in the Aston Martin. Dennis Lind launching himself over the curbs, getting sideways as he did so. And the car battling its way towards the pit stops as running a little bit deep. Charlie Robertson trying to find a way past the Jordan Collard driven number two McLaren. Ian Loggy coming under attack as hard at work was the Morgan Tilbrook Marcus Clatton driven McLaren as the pit window opened and the cars cycle through out of balance stalling losing time he'd lose more with a spin late in the race as well but he jumped ahead of the 77 McLaren as the cars ran down the pit lane and a lap or two later because he'd been in the gravel in came Tom Onslow Cole to relay Kevin Say we got the green flag waved at the end of the safety car period and it was Ian Loggy ahead of Michael Igo but the number six Mercedes would get a drive-through penalty for a pit exit violation going and slowing and therefore balking anybody behind so that cost it time attention switched to GT4 there was a clash between these two cars Chris Solkelt getting together with the number four McLaren for which the BMW would serve a penalty there it was but in the end it was going to be a Century Motorsport win and also a championship battles were raging on lower down Richard Neary getting onto the back of Liam Machitsky off the road ran Mark Sanson but he was still on to win the Pro-Am elements of GT4 as this clash, Michael Benyar out of nowhere tried to get up past James Kell. Contact was made and Benyar fell further away with the damage. Also delayed was James Kell, and that meant the throw on the inside would go Gus Burton and Will Burns BMW to take the lead, to take the win, to take the championship as Michael Igo and Phil Keane came through to win race two of the weekend at Alton Park. It brings them into the mix in the championship. And that will be at Donington Park over the weekend of October the 16th and 17th. The GT4 Championship for Will Burns then and uh, co-driver Gus Burton. But from Alton Park, from Brin Lucas, Andy McEwen and David Addison, it's goodbye. <laughs>